So what you normally do is uh, you normally do something called uh, Henley's Cox postulates. Does anybody know what Cox postulates is? Nodding, a few nods going on. Well, uh, briefly put, Cox postulates is a, a traditional method for uh, finding out what causes a disease. Uh, it's used very commonly uh, in the terrestrial environment. It's actually relatively easy to do in the terrestrial environment. I say relatively because it's quite actually difficult uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but you simply need to isolate uh, your proposed causal agent. Very simple. Uh, you have to then culture up that uh, bacterium. Um, and in the marine environment, uh, it's thought that between 70 to 90% of bacteria can't be cultured. So you're trying to find that needle in a haystack, then culture up a needle in a haystack, uh, which causes things uh, to be quite tricky. Um, then you need to inoculate a healthy individual with that specific uh, pathogen, usually a, a bacterium. Um, and then you need to cause the same disease to occur in your inoculated uh, coral in this instance compared to the, the one you find in the wild. You need to re-isolate the same pathogen, link them up genetically, so match the sequences together, um, and then you've proven disease causation. Simple, yeah? Um, nay on impossible in the marine environment, we would argue. Um, for one main reason, uh, I've already mentioned that uh, most of marine bacteria, uh, and not to even mention other uh, different microorganisms, can't be cultured uh, in the traditional way. Second step is they live in this microbial soup, which we call the ocean. There's bacteria everywhere. And if you actually keep a, a sterile cor coral uh, in nicely filtered seawater, we did this as a trial to try and do Cox postulates in a, a really sterile environment, you can boil the corals up to 36, 37 degrees, and they live quite happily ever after. Uh, you can't cause a stress at all. So it's definitely something to do with this uh, microbial soup, uh, which is the source of the pathogens. Um, and then the, the, the other third and final uh, major problem as far as uh, doing this Cox postulates uh, traditional approach uh, is that you can't um, actually compare what occurs in a tank system to what occurs in the wild. It's very difficult uh, to relate these two different diseases. People have tried, and quite often people have failed, including myself, uh, to try and do that approach. And I don't admit to failure very often. Um, but what we, what we thought, genius brainwave, um, was a, a, a new approach to trying to do this disease causation. Um, so we thought we'd flip it around. And instead of trying to uh, cause a disease, why don't we cure a disease? If we can cure a disease, uh, then it gives us an idea of what's actually causing it. It, gives us, it gets us that little bit closer. It doesn't 100% prove it, uh, but it gets us that uh, extra few steps to figuring out what's going on. So we use this novel approach. We use four different antibiotics. Uh, paramycin, ampicillin, gentamicin, and metronidazole. Uh, most of these are uh, easy to get hold of. Uh, some of them, paramycin particularly, you have to kind of uh, beg, borrow, and steal it. Um, but if you ask nicely to a, a big pharmaceutical giant, uh, they'll usually give you uh, a very small dose. Um, it's really expensive, uh, and one of the problems with the, uh, this experiment was we could only get enough uh, to dose our corals once, uh, whilst the other ones we had enough uh, to to dose the entire reef system if we chose. We didn't, just in case you're worried. Um, but paramycin uh, targets is, is a broad spectrum antibiotic. It's a, it's a very good antibiotic, and, and it tackles everything, uh, potentially fungi as well, but uh, mainly uh, bacteria and, more importantly, ciliates in our instance. Ampicillin only targets gram-positive and some gram-negative species of bacteria. So gram-positive and gram-negative is based on uh, the different morphology of bacteria, and it's classified on how it stains, how it takes up the stain. Gentamicin uh, is a gra targets gram-negative, so it shouldn't affect the gram-positive. Uh, and metronidazole we used particularly targeting these protozoans, these ciliates, which we saw eating away at the tissue. We wanted to prove our initial hypothesis was that the ciliates were the causal agents, uh, but as you saw in the histology, it was more likely that the bacteria are the initial systemic infection, and these ciliates are likely coming in eating this health-compromised tissue. So still very important. But if we use this technique, uh, what do we find? So these were disease corals. These corals were uh, progressing in the wild, and then when we brought them in the tank, they continued to progress, so we were happy uh, that the disease was active. Uh, we obviously had controls, healthy ones, which we uh, kept for the, the six-day experiment. Um, we wanted to run the experiment for three weeks, but we had two weeks of str struggle. 
uh, trying to do uh, experiments on fishermen's doorsteps and in hotel rooms and things like that because uh, Venezuela wasn't quite ready for us researchers to come over and uh, do a mass experiment. Um, so that caused a, a, a few delays and a, and a bit of um, interesting novel ways of, of uh, adapting in the field. Um, but as you can see, the healthy ones stayed healthy all the time. Um, we also dosed healthy corals with uh, doses of uh, the antibiotic to make sure that the antibiotic wasn't having any particular effect uh, on the corals themselves because that was quite important. Uh, we thought if we uh, killed off uh, corals quite quickly uh, by using the antibiotic, it might actually be interfering uh, with the healthy system itself. So we needed to make sure that wasn't occurring. Uh, previously as well, we had also done uh, trials in, in, uh, in enclosed environments in, in tanks to look at how these antibiotics affected specific types of uh, pathogenic uh, organisms. So we, we knew what we were using were the target uh, the proposed causal agents. Um, and as you can see, the white band, uh, a further control, that was the disease corals which we left uh, to die. We didn't treat them. Um, and you can see that it's not a typo. Day four is uh, they died uh, up to day four. Um, and what you quite often see uh, with corals is that they'll do something called uh, rapid tissue loss. Um, and it's um, also known in, in the aquarium trade as shutdown reaction. Um, and when a tissue uh, gets to a certain point, uh, the coral just gives up and the tissue just disappears really, really quickly. And if you think about um, how a coral works uh, as a colony, uh, if it's got a, a band here in the middle of the colony, uh, all the, the base of the colony can actually give a lot of energy to try and fight off that area. Uh, but up at the tip, uh, it's only got a small amount of, of tissue surrounding it, um, so it hasn't got as much energy to fight off any invading uh, pathogens, uh, so it dies a lot quicker. And that's what happens when uh, a lot of tank experiments. But as you can see down at the bottom, uh, we've got the different treatments, ampicillin, gentamicin, metronidazole, and paramycin. Um, and you'll notice that ampicillin and paramycin, the two ends, uh, that the, those antibiotics cured the disease. We actually treated the disease. There's a chap falling asleep there. I must be doing a good job. Yeah, looking at you. Um, there you go. You laugh at that one. That's good. Um, but what you can also see is that gent gentamicin and metronidazole, uh, the tissue actually uh, carries on increasing. It slows down. The rate of tissue loss slows down. These actually stayed for the entire uh, time of the, the period um, of the experiment. Um, but you can still see that it's clearly advancing. All my use of Photoshop is very good. I just delete a bit of tissue here and move some there. Um, but what you'll also notice um, in this instance is that the, the skeleton, which is normally pristine white, um, is completely covered uh, in fragmented bits of tissue. Uh, this kind of string vest, uh, if you like to uh, picture it that way. Um, so something's happening there, and it's looking like a different pathology. And remember, metronidazole was targeting just uh, the protozoans, or that was what we were hoping it was doing. Uh, so if we do this, uh, what happens is now we're looking for something uh, which is, this is only a subset of the, the original bacteria. If you remember, we ended up with hundreds of bacteria. We came down with 13 potential pathogens. And then now we want something which is absent in the healthy, in the non-diseased tissues, something present, uh, dominant in the diseased tissues, absent in ampicillin and paramycin, which are the ones which treated it, so therefore they're now healthy, uh, but still present in gentamicin and metronidazole where the disease carried up. Yep, everybody with me? Good. I'll take no answer as a yes. Um, so that, like, that narrows it down uh, to only three uh, potential uh, pathogens. You've got the Vibrio carcari, uh, Lactobacillus, um, and the Bacillus species. This rosier virus uh, was an interesting one, and it was a potential candidate. But you can see uh, that in, in only one instance in the gentamicin, uh, the first row of the gentamicin column, uh, you'll see that we wiped it out. But in all cases of gentamicin, the disease carried on progressing, which eliminated that one as a potential pathogen. We did the same with the ciliates, um, and we actually found uh, that only one ciliate this one on the left uh, was important. What you can see is that uh, another evidence that these guys are having some uh, role in uh, disease causation uh, is that they both have uh, symbiotic algae inside. So they're ingesting these symbiotic algae. Um, this one is Philaster. It was a new species. Um, and I recently 
uh, put out a paper which has uh, named it after my lovely wife sitting on the front row there, just to give her a bit of embarrassment. Uh, and so it's now called Philasta lucinda. Um, and this one is Vera strombidium uh, chelim. Uh, and, but what you could see there is that the various strombidium was still present in the ampicillin uh, treatment, uh, which stopped the disease and therefore suggests it's not actually a main causal agent. And that this particular ciliate is actually just mopping up any loose cymbididium associated with the tissue. All the other species of, of ciliates we found were, were uh, common uh, ciliate species which you find associated uh, with any kind of uh, bare skeleton or uh, necrosis or dead coral. Uh, and there are a lot of them are bacteriophores, but you also get things like uh, Pseudochronopsis, um, which is a, a ciliophore. So uh, this other ciliate eats other ciliates, and then you've got ones which eat bacteria and some which actually eat coral tissue. So a whole ecosystem occurring on another ecosystem on another ecosystem. So it's a never-ending world when you look down a microscope. So what this study showed us uh, was our first indication uh, that you've got one or more microorganisms, this consortium, uh, which are the primary pathogens of white band disease. You've got this initial systemic infection, this, this bacterial infection, which can be caused by any one of those three uh, pathogens. Um, and we found that it doesn't have to be those three pathogens as well. It can be any potential pathogen coming in, but causing this initial infection uh, causes this necrosis of the symbiotic algae in the tissues. And then you get this ciliate histophagy coming in where the ciliates are eating uh, this health compromised tissue. Um, and then also you get treated uh, with these two types of antibiotics. Um, but as I mentioned, we're now more interested in trying to look at the healthy bacteria. Um, and something we're looking into, we would never suggest you go out and treat your reefs with uh, uh, antibiotics because it, it comes with a whole suite of other problems uh, like uh, antibiotic resistance. And we could create a superbug which could eat all the corals in the world. Um, and then the, the name of uh, Dr. Sweet wouldn't be very good in the the coral uh, field anymore would be chased from every reef in the world. Um, and I'm not quite ready for that, maybe in a few years. Um, but what I, I'm thinking of looking into at the moment uh, is maybe a probiotic approach. Uh, we have a drink in the UK called Yakult. I don't know if you have that here. Um, but it's a probiotic uh, yogurty drink, uh, which helps your, your gut bacteria put into good shape. Um, and that's something we're thinking of trying to develop for a coral. So feeding it a little a uh, yogurt proteobacteria uh, mix. I don't know how the corals are going to like that, but uh, it's something focusing more on the good rather than the bad stuff. Um, so if we uh, zoom over to the other side of the ocean and we can look at white syndrome and brown band disease, uh, this will hopefully uh, show you how similar diseases are uh, in all the different uh, reefs uh, around the world. Um, interestingly, white syndrome uh, is just caused by this white band, uh, and brown band disease is simply named because they've got this mass uh, of a different ciliate from the same genus called Philasta guamensis, uh, which causes just a, a visual brown band, and it's just a huge mass of ciliates. Um, in 2012, uh, we wrote this first paper which showed us the first indication of ciliates uh, causing disease, and as you can see, uh, hopefully, again, if the light's okay, uh, you get this mass uh, of two different species, the Philasta guamensis and the Philasta lucinda, uh, moving in, eating the tissue. And what you could see, uh, hopefully, if the, if the light's right, is that they actually go in underneath the skeleton. Remember, the skeleton's very porous, lots of holes, and these ciliates can burrow underneath, and they attack the coral from a more vulnerable underneath stage uh, where they haven't got as much defense. Um, but also these corals are in a stressed state, usually due to something like climate change, but it can be anything from a tourist kick uh, to an anchor damage or anything like that. Um, and it gives them this opening for, for diseases to come in. Um, what you also might see is these uh, white things shooting out of the corals. Uh, they're the coral's mesoteral filaments. Uh, it's basically the gut of the coral uh, being shot out, um, and they're full uh, a really strong, powerful nematocyst. So it's like a last-ditch attempt uh, of the coral to try and fight off uh, this invasive uh, front of nasty pathogens. Um, and here you can see uh, some light microscope imagery uh, of the different ciliate communities associated with these diseases. Uh, this chappy up there is Philasta lucinda. Looks very much like my wife, as you can see. Um, 
no laugh there, no, all right, okay, carrying on. Uh, this one's Philaster Guamensis. Uh, we've got Vera Strombidium, we've got a Euplotes, a Euplotes again uh, shows that it's e eating the symbiotic algae, uh, but we haven't found it consistently uh, between, different organisms, uh, between different diseases in different countries, so again, uh, it's likely uh, to be a secondary um, ciliate eating up uh, some of the, the already expelled zooxanthellae. This might be uh, occurring around bleaching time as well. This is the Pseudochronopsis, uh, the one which uh, is known to eat uh, other ciliates. It's a ciliophore, and then the rest are all uh, bacteriophores, just eating uh, any bacteria which is likely settling on this exposed uh, coral skeleton. So if we use a different technique, the first time we did it, we used a, a, a non-culture molecular technique called clone libraries. Um, and then we uh, embraced modern technology in this instance, um, and we looked at um, deep sequencing. So in this case, we did something called 454 pyro sequencing. Um, and the idea behind that um, is it's very much more expensive, which is, uh, breaks the bank. Um, but it gives you a more in-depth idea of the whole uh, complete uh, microbes associated with your corals. So in this case, as you can see, we, we got a, a, a large number uh, of potential pathogens. These are the healthy ones, so they're, they're what uh, should be there. Um, then if you bring in the disease, uh, we're looking again uh, for the same sort of pattern. So uh, the dark black is the most dense uh, corals. The white ones uh, means there's uh, very low or none at all. Um, and we're looking for something which is absent or rare again in the healthy, present in the disease. If we use our wonderful novel technology as well, uh, you start looking for something which uh, works on ampicillin as well and paramycin. Um, but then, uh, so ampicillin and paramycin are the, the next columns there. Metronidazole is the one at the end. Just mixed it up to keep you all awake. Um, metronidazole still did exactly the same as what we saw before. It still progressed, but at a slower rate. Um, and if we do our work, we, we get down to just two potential pathogens out of what could be 50 or 60 in this instance. And this is a, a Veruco microbacteria uh, and a Rhinochia, two very unusual species, uh, not been associated particularly uh, with coral diseases before, uh, but still pathogenic. Um, the Ver Veruco microbacteria causes things like Verrucas and stuff in humans, um, but it also causes other uh, sort of diseases uh, and necrotic lesions um, in other animals and other organisms. Um, but this strengthens our argument that it doesn't necessarily need to be these two particular pathogens. Uh, it could be the Vibrios and it could be um, Lactobacillus. Um, and depending on the geographical location, the particular coral you look at, uh, the time when you're looking at that, uh, you're likely to find a wide variety of different pathogens. So all the other studies which tried to claim there was one only one pathogen, they're still right, um, but it's not just looking for this uh, one uh, smoking gun, if you will. Uh, you're actually looking for lots of opportunistic pathogens, uh, but then these ciliates come in and cause the pathology of the disease. So there's a difference between a pathogen of a disease and something which causes uh, the pathology. So it's down to terminology in this instance. So we've got bacteria, any opportunistic uh, pathogenic bacteria can call, is the initial systemic pathogen of this disease, but then the pathogen which causes the pathology um, are the ciliates. So two very different things, but really close together. And you need to understand the terminology uh, to understand what actually causes uh, these specific diseases. So hopefully I've not lost you in that instance. Everybody lost? No, there's only one person just getting a bit confused. Um, in this instance, uh, if we look at the metronidazole treatment, um, these are the ones which still had that strange bit of uh, necrotic tissue associated with it. Uh, we found uh, what we were looking for, these bacteria. They were present uh, in that kind of stringy tissue uh, which was left behind. If we wiped out the ciliates, uh, we actually found these bacteria present. Um, and that shows that uh, you are getting this initial bacterial systemic infection, but the ciliates, on every other time, whenever anybody else has looked at uh, histology uh, associated with coral diseases, they're actually looking at healthy tissue. So that's why we're not finding any difference between healthy tissue and disease tissue, because we've lost the disease tissue. Uh, it's all been eaten away before we've even got there. Um, so that's quite a, a, an interesting find. 
Uh, but just to throw a bit of uh, confusion into the mix, uh, we, we looked at bacteria, fungi, ciliates, um, and then we found these beasties. Um, I just recently did a, a, a lecture at a, a parasitology conference, um, and I thought these were virus-like particles, so bringing viruses into the mix. Uh, there was a, a specialist on viruses who said she had never seen anything like this. Um, I, they still fit into the same size class as, as a virus, uh, but no one I've ever spoken to has seen anything uh, akin to it. Um, so that's a bit of a puzzle, um, and kind of got me at a bit of a dead end as far as uh, this is concerned, but it's something we're desperately trying to look into and, and figure out what's going on. Uh, so maybe um, corals uh, are catching a cold, where you have viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, anything coming in uh, which can wipe out uh, the immune system of the coral itself. We're not just looking at one particular uh, bacterium, we're not just looking at bacterium in general, we have to look at the whole wide sweep uh, of microorganisms, and then we also need to look into the immunity of the coral itself. So it's complex, even though they're quite simple uh, organisms, it's a very complex environment uh, to do this sort of study.